I, and I agree, you know, I think this, this, you know, if you look at some of the people in countries where their, their currency, their unit of account is hyperinflating, the majority of people at the moment are still going to um, currencies like USDT because, as as you pointed out, they ha they need stability in order right. to be able to pay their bills. Um, and so I think you've absolutely you're absolutely right. The only thing I would say is that I think it could be easy to underestimate the um, the the market cap growth potential of Bitcoin if certain you know sovereign wealth funds for example start taking it seriously i think you could see a supply shock very quickly well it goes back to that volatility i mean that that, that, that that's where it's a good thing right it's, right it's it's a bad thing when it's uh down by 30 percent in one day but it's great it's if it's up by 50 percent in a day or something like that and and where you've got higher highs and higher lows Sure, but I think you know that's the volatility is is on the pathway to stability, right? And it, and so yeah, yeah. when the when the market cap gets to a certain level and and supply is so low, I, don't, I yeah, I mean, you you, you the, those dynamics you're probably kind of more familiar with how things are going to act under those conditions than than I am, but definitely think we're on that pathway. Yeah, the problem with with that is. Not that it'll play out this way, but on paper, the problem is, although you have price at an all-time high, demand can be at an all-time low if, if supply is just decreased faster. And therefore, if you've got demand at an all-time low and you get a bit of additional supply above and beyond that demand, then that's where you hit that air gap on yeah, the downside. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, that's not to say that it goes down under its prior low it just that's when you know, it just gaps down by whatever 10 15 percent or something like that but chris help me understand the layer two so if we're if, if i'm trying to transact in a way where the central planners won't know if i'm buying beef can that be done on layer two or does that have to be layer one uh so uh, it can be it can uh, bj's just come off on stage so welcome bj but yeah it can it can be done on layer two so um the the way that you would do that is you with lightning for example is you peg in and peg out of lightning so you do a transaction into a, a lightning um liquidity provider um, uh, basically a node, a, a, a lightning node runner, and then you can then do transactions where it's effectively um, pegged in Bitcoin that that is then off the chain. So the transactions are then um, much more private than they are on a on a public ledger. Um, <clears throat> so in theory, in theory, the node runners themselves could could see um, more information about the transactions. Um, but uh, and I think that's why in the US, for example, you look at um, custodial services like Wallet of Satoshi, and they've withdrawn from the US market because yeah, I think I they know that the the legislation is coming for um, those types of networks where where the privacy is is so high that they they don't know what's going on. You know, the the thing is with on chain is he, he, at some point if you want to come off onto the fiat rails. Um, you you have to. You, you, it's hard to do that without KYCing yourself, and they're going to make yeah. it impossible yeah. for you to do that. Um, so uh, until you have these circular economies where you can use um, Bitcoin much more widely, um, as as you said yourself um, the other day, um, you know that that's that that is a that is a problem, and that's how they, it looks like they're going to try and control. Is layer two? Well, layer two is is well, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, or layer, or layer. Correct me if I'm wrong, but layer one would be impossible, or, or you know, incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to uh, for the central planners to know kind of what's going on. Uh, 
Uh, so, so layer layer two would be much more difficult. No, not I wouldn't say anything's impossible with tech, but I would say la layer two makes it much more difficult. Layer one um, is relatively easy. Um, but when you say easy, you're, you're talking about easy in terms of uh, the central planner not knowing who's behind the transaction. I think the central planners are going to know who's behind the transaction much more on layer one than they will on layer two. Really? Okay, so maybe I'm I'm mixing up the terms here. Yeah. So is layer one is on chain, correct? Correct. And layer two is off chain. Correct. I thought it would be the opposite. No. Huh. So why is that? Well, and, I mean, do you want to, and bring up any speakers you want to bring up? Yeah, I'm bringing people up that I've invited um, invited up. So we've we've got on the stage now Luke Broyles. So Luke, welcome, and Jimmy Song and BJ. So hi guys, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hey guys, I, I can answer at least in a, the very dummy way to explain is when it's off chain, and you know you have you're basically exchanging with somebody off the network. Essentially, I know that's not the right term. Developers don't get angry with me. But because you're removed from the chain and you and I have a channel between each other, nobody can really see that. Mm. So it's it's hyper anonymous at that point, right? So like using cash. Yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. And you know, from my ah. perspective, I've only ever used like I've bought only a couple of things with Bitcoin. One was on chain, which we discussed last time when I explained, you know, doing my book with the guys in Panama. But the mm. other time was in El Salvador. On the beach in El Zante, I needed to buy some sandals and a t-shirt and, you know, shorts and stuff. And it was just an easier way for me to transact because I'm Canadian. So everywhere I go all over the world, when I use a visa, especially I'm in my tractor trailer right now, parking it. So I'm in the, I'm in, I just came back from the U.S. Whenever I have to buy something in the U.S., it's using a Visa card, so I'm exchanging, and it's it's obnoxious. But when I was in El Salvador, and I'm using the Lightning Network from my Moon Wallet, which everybody's going to yell at me for using, but it's a mm -hmm. wallet that does both on-chain and Lightning, now I don't have to deal with the exchange rate. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah or the, the or the Visa, you know, being red flag. You know, exactly. Bank, you know, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, again, once you've gone through what I and some of the other Canadians have gone through with having all our bank accounts and credit cards and everything frozen, yeah, you right. know, you get a little PTSD from it. I still don't have a PayPal account. I'm permanently banned from PayPal. I have no idea why. You know? Yeah. So, Chris, l let me pose the question a little bit different here. And, and Jimmy or for any of the speakers, if you want to chime in here, please feel free. If I don't want... If I'm going to buy something that I know is going to impact my social score, if, if the central planners find out about it, how do I do that using the tools that are available to us now? Can, Jimmy, would you mind answering that from a technical perspective? I think it'd be really useful for George to understand the, the mechanisms here. Are you cool to go through that? Uh, sorry, sorry I, w I was a little distracted. Can you repeat the question? Sure. If uh, let's just assume we've got a CBDC right now, and I need to make a transaction tomorrow that I know is going to negatively impact my social score, so I don't want the central mm -hmm. planners or the authoritarians to know about it. So, using the tools that we have right now, the apps—I mean, we talked about Moon. We talked about—I know the ones I downloaded for my trip were Blue Wallet and Strike. Uh, if I want if i want to make sure that central planners don't know that i'm buying diesel or beef tomorrow or something like that how do i what's the best way to do that utilizing the tools that we have right now is it better off chain on chain how is that how does that work uh, jimmy am you is that mate I think. Yeah, I think Jim's like gonna, he be, here he comes. Here he goes. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry about that. I, I'm having some like uh, connection issues with my Bluetooth earset, so uh, that that that's why I'm coming in and out. But if I understand your cor uh, question correctly, you're, it, it's really about privacy. How much privacy do you have yeah. on layer one, layer two, or whatever? Um, and the fact of the matter is, if you kind of know what you're doing on layer one, you definitely have significant amounts of privacy. Uh, there, there are all kinds of techniques like coin joins and. Uh, peer swaps and things like that, which lets you have on-chain layer one privacy. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is all of the transactions are recorded on-chain. So if you find out information later, you, you sort of have this ability to go back time and say, okay, it was uh, so-and-so that did it. So it's possible that uh, whatever transaction did, you would, people would know later. Does that make sense? Um, layer two is a little uh, more interesting in that depending on the protocol, some of, some of that isn't on chain, some of it can be on chain. So something like Liquid uh, has a blockchain and there are UTFs. And that means that you have the ability to sort of uh, see some of the stuff. But something like Lightning, uh, unless you're, uh, you know, you, you plant a whole bunch of nodes and kind of, uh, you know, triangulate a lot of information, it, get, it gets fairly difficult. So I would say that layer twos in general are, are, are more private. And if you get something like Fetty, um, that's almost impossible. That, that one's probably the closest one to cash. There's a reason why Bitcoiners call it eCash. Um, you know, it comes from David Chom's eCash paper from 1980 or so. Uh, but that, that, it, it, really does act like cash. Uh, you need to trust the issuer still. So there are different sort of like uh, things that you have to think about uh, in terms of trade-offs. Yeah, uh, but, but you know, like that, that, that's a trade-off that you kind of have to have is that generally um, uh, the, the privacy comes at the risk of some, some trust somewhere. Uh, so there, there's various levels of uh, trust that you can have obviously, but that, that's the main one. Hmm. Okay. So it sounds like the, the benefit here is although the government might know what I'm doing and they may be able to give me a social score or uh, apply that transaction to my social score if they really, really want to, I got to do a lot of digging, but th what they won't be able to do is stop the transaction. Is that a correct statement? Yes. That's correct. Uh, so they can't because they're not the middle, uh, they're, they're like not the um, sort of like intermediary right. or the third party. Uh, the, currently, the way it works is that if you are a um, uh, an intermediary, then you can you can do all sorts of things to uh, sort of like, um, you know, stop it, right? They deputize, you know, credit card companies and banks and places like that to do sort of the dirty work for them. And, um, and of course, they comply because they, they want to continue operating. Uh, with Bitcoin, for, like if, if you're paying, there, there's nobody like sort of stopping you. Now, like on a layer two or whatever, it can be a little bit different because if you if, if it, there's like a dependence on like um, uh, a, like a intermediary node, it's possible that they could reject you, but there's no reason for them to necessarily know what's going on. Uh, so it, it, they'd be sort of like blocking things blind. Um, you know, something like uh, Liquid, you know, it's a federation and they're on different jurisdictions. So, um, you know, they purposefully make it hard to do something like that. And, uh, and yeah, I, I mean, again, these are all sort of like different trade-offs depending on specifically what you're looking for. And they have different characteristics. And there are even more layer two technologies that are all sort of like... Um, uh, in play here that, uh, that, that can do various things. So these are all things that you have to think about uh, with respect to, you know, like what you want exactly and what you're protecting against. If you're, if you're buying coffee at a Bitcoin conference, no one cares um, about like, you know, whatever. But you're, you're sending, you know, $30,000 to your relatives in Venezuela, you know, that, that, that's, um, that's another thing entirely. Okay. So if I'm understanding this correctly, with the with layer two, you have more privacy, but the trade off is counterparty risk. Whereas yeah, that's, that's with layer correct. one, you have no counterparty risk, 
but you might may have some privacy issues. Yeah, again, like if you if you know what you're doing, then uh, then you can you can get pretty good privacy on layer one. I mean, it's it's the entire chain chain analysis thing where you know you're trying to figure out who did what. That they I, I I've been in some of those cases. They're, they're very very difficult, right. and yeah. a lot of it is based on heuristics that are not proven and that are easily broken with like a single coin join and things like that. Um, and peer swaps, and again, there, there's so many ways in which you can sort of obf obf obfuscate certain things. Um, so, but yeah, I, the, the privacy on layer one is definitely there uh, if you want it. It just it's going to probably cost you some money uh, if you're if you're doing a coin join. You have to find somebody that'll take it and fix your coins and so on. So these are all things that you have to consider. Mm. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think George, it might be worth just setting the scene now we've got a few more people here around the kind of reason for this what well, one obviously you're doing research for a whiteboard that you're going to do a video on right and and secondly um obviously swift have announced their cbdc i think that's quite a nice um a, a nice reason for framing the conversation and i think jimmy to your point around if you know what you're doing i think you know the vast majority of people if, if we're going to use um, Bitcoin and layer twos as an alternative to CBDCs, then I think we have to almost look at the lowest common denominator rather than the most technical of people. Because, like like you said, even even if you are careful and you figure it out for one transaction and then you make a mistake in the future, it's then backwards, um, you know, tr traceable to potentially. So, um, and I think the other thing is is that also. This isn't necessary to be doing something that's that's wrong or immoral or where you should have to pay money to obfuscate yourself. It's just the, the kind of principle of is it just your right to spend your money where and how you want to? Um, and on that basis, you know, what, what are the tools that facilitate that kind of out of the box rather than needing a uh, <laughs> some specialist knowledge that obviously you guys do have? Yeah, so... And this is probably a stupid question, but to increase your privacy on layer one, if you wanted to avoid the potential counterparty risk, is it just a matter of like buying a burner phone that's just completely anonymous and then you're using the, uh, what would be the blue wallet or whatever on the burner phone? So then there's just, I don't know how the hell they'd find out who, who you were in that case. But is no no. no. Uh, so it's it's not about using a wallet on like a different phone. They're not necessarily tracking the hardware or anything like that. The thing that they can track is everything on the blockchain, which is basically your ad uh, that various addresses, which addresses are being spent together, things like that. So when when you have um uh you know certain coins that are utxos uh in in our parlance that are spent together they're assumed to be from the same person um so really what you want to do is sort of like uh put them through coin joins or peer swaps or things like that so that uh it's not traceable on the blockchain so what what you can do for example is if uh if uh, you and i george had uh one bitcoin each and we wanted to sort of like mix it up together um, I would send you one Bitcoin in one transaction and you would send me Bitcoin in another transaction and we would have, uh, you know, UTXOs. I would have a UTXO that traces to you. You would have a tra UTXO that traces to me, uh, assuming like there's some, uh, you know, third party or some somebody else that I did transactions with that somebody can trace. Uh, but that, that uh, you know, traceability kind of gets broken uh, and that, that's sort of like a peer swap. Or you could you could have many coins spent together and apart. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of coin join implementations that let you do that. But you you need to do something on chain basically to break the heuristics that chain chain analysis companies use to figure out who owns mm. what. Yeah, George. George, I got two questions sure. for you. First, do you do you know what coin joining is? Uh, because I didn't know until. Uh, last couple of years or so and have you do you know how a node works uh to a certain degree but i'd love for you to explain it further well i, I think somebody more technical should explain it but coin joining basically from what i understand 
uh, a basic or a coin mixer basically erases part of the history or the history of that coin so it's no longer traceable which is why some governments uh, that understand what's going on want to make coin mixing illegal mm. and then in terms of like for me what really two things really opened up my eyes first uh, setting up a node which is ironically in Medellin, Colombia because there's no way I'm keeping that within Canada <laughs> but the other thing is setting up a miner and you know just buying a basic s9 miner setting it up and julian helped me set it up kinetic finance everybody here knows him and it becomes this magic box on a table right next to my balcony that's just creating money out of nowhere because you know i don't i don't pay for electricity in my place mm -hmm. it just sits there and every day i go in there's more satoshis being added to the wallet and it just philosophically, it hits you once you have a node and a miner set up. And these are really basic. You don't have to be really technical to have these two things set up. It really changed the experience uh, in terms of trusting what Bitcoin is from a philosophical perspective. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, okay. So then how are they tracing the, the, the individual to the transaction on layer one? I mean, I, I get that you've got to okay. have effectively a social security number, but there's no, uh, you can do that without giving your, your personal information, right? Yeah, Jimmy, before you continue, because this was relevant to the experience in Ottawa, because we have a legal case where our 20 some odd million dollars was frozen by the government. It was deemed illegal and it's now sitting in escrow and none of us could touch the $23 million, but the only money that got through was the million dollars of Bitcoin. And the only Bitcoin that got through was by uh, 15 police, police officers raiding at gunpoint Caribou and stealing his computer and his phones. That's the only way they got it. But one of the things happened in this legal case, so they get into the details, is they, in the, the case, they put a list of about 200 and change suspected bitcoin wallets mm. of money that was supposed to be going to truckers now i don't know whose wallets those are none of the truckers know who those wallets are they just seem to arbitrarily pick up some wallets the same way craig wright did and just put up on a list and submit them to the court but because it's pseudo anonymous nobody knows whose wallets those are and the government was unable to stop any transactions in and out of those wallets. Okay. Yeah. So I. I well, well, so let me answer the question that you had was, which was, how did they identify a particular address with a particular yeah. person? And usually, this is done at the point when the Bitcoin is bought. So if you go and buy Bitcoin from Coinbase or Kraken or something like that, there's a record of you buying some Bitcoin for cash. And then when you withdraw it, there's an address that you withdraw to that the exchange knows. Now, if you're a government and they're within your jurisdiction, you can, uh, you know, you can ask them for the records. Okay, this address, who does it belong to? But more likely, uh, it's more like we want to know the addresses, uh, withdrawal addresses of this particular person. And then, the, uh, you know, they'll, they'll give those over. And then, you know, after it's withdrawn, then you can trace it on the blockchain. But again, there are ways to sort of like defeat the general heuristics that are used uh, uh, by chain analysis companies to trace where those go. But that's generally how it's Yeah, done. that's that's what I was thinking through the other day when I was on a conference call with Luke, uh, who, who was uh, helping us with the overall the overall trip. So if, if you are able to get the Bitcoin, if the Bitcoin comes from a miner, and then it's peer to peer, then there's absolutely no way they can do it. it, it exactly. Has to go through exactly. one of the exchanges where there's KYC or, or you actually set up an account giving your information. Well, so that, that can be true, but in practice, here's what happens. Um, you know, when a miner mines some coins, first of all, they advertise what mining pool that they're from. And the mining pool, usually if you're a miner, you have an account with the mining pool so you could withdraw the Bitcoin that's owed to you. Uh, so, I mean, 
Now that that could be anonymous, and uh, many of them are. Uh, but you know, there, there's still info out there. They uh, the you know, if they're keeping IP logs and things like that, there's uh, certainly ways for them to figure out. Okay, that that IP range is from this part of the country, and so on. And they can they can just sort of like there, there's a lot of information that leaks. Like perfect privacy is very yeah, difficult. Okay. Uh, but but that's not you know like. Uh, you know what? What a lot of um, I think there was a market at one point in time for like freshly minted coins and sort of like ways to coin join off of those so that you get you get stuff that no one's ever touched. Um, and there was a small market for that, but it like turned out that not that many people were interested. They would rather just have Bitcoin and that's mm. it. Okay, yeah, this is making a, a lot of sense now. That, that's uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so I'll go to some other questions. Or Chris, do you have any input on that? Uh, no, I think, you know, again, going back to the kind of normie journey, uh, I guess if you're kind of whiteboarding it out, you know, they're gonna people are going to be going to those exchanges like Coinbase, you know, the kind of mainstream ones. They're, they're, they're part of the, 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 leg, the legislation to sign up with those kind of exchanges is that you KYC yourself first so they know who you are. You buy the Bitcoin, and then the advice in the Bitcoin community is don't leave your coins on exchange. Um, and right. so you you would then move them to cold storage as you learn more about Bitcoin. Um, and that's the kind of general path to someone taking self custody, I would say, and the most certainly the most um, prominent way of of kind of interacting, if you like. And then as you go on that journey and learn, and I think the the one thing I would say is if you if you want to use it as a relatively short term savings account, you know, the one thing to consider is if you coin join and they look at the transaction history of those coins that you want to then um, bring back to fiat rails for whatever reason. So for example, you want to, I don't know, buy an emergency boiler because something's broken down in your house or you want to buy a car or, you know, Bitcoin's appreciated to the point where you can go and buy a house. You know, I, I think it's an interesting thing to think about, you know, whether or not you should, um, jump into these types of um, solutions like coin joining where potentially you could um, almost block yourself from being able to to um, come back to fiat. Now, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners would say, why would you bother? But, you know, again, mainstream wise, sometimes, sometimes people need to. And so I think these are things that people need to sort of consider seriously around what they choose to do or not do. Um, and, and obviously we all agree that it's wrong for your money to be blocked under those circumstances, um, but but nevertheless that could happen. So I think it's just being being cautious and understanding the repercussions of your actions as you engage with this technology. But that's just my opinion. It'd be interesting to hear other people's view on that as well. Yeah, let's bring up. Uh, let's or Jimmy, you want to chime in there? I think BJ's got a comment as well. Yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, like let let you know that there are other options to getting it besides uh, Coinbase or an exchange. Um, if you go to your local meetup, almost certainly somebody will sell you Bitcoin yeah. at the current market price. If you want, and uh, if you really like, if privacy is really important to you, that's one way. If you're outside of the United States, there are all sorts of Bitcoin ATMs that don't require any sort of KYC or ID or anything like that. So you can get get those and no, no one's going to know anything, right? Unless there's like surveillance cameras near that ATM that the government can look up or something. Right? But there, there, there are various uh, ways in which you can get a lot of this stuff without necessarily having to, um, you know, go through the traditional exchange route or something like that. And there's certainly peer to peer decentralized exchange markets and other things. So uh, if you are starting the journey and privacy is important, I would I would strongly encourage you to go down that route so that there's uh, sort of nothing that is sort of like identifiable. If this is something that you're going to keep around for a while and you don't want anyone to know about it, that's that's how it goes. Yeah, the, the Bitcoin I got for the trip specifically is just uh, peer to peer. The, the the main reason I'm I'm thinking through all this stuff is just so I can communicate this not just on a whiteboard video but moving forward uh, when we all are trying to you know think of solutions and how to interact outside of the system and I can also communicate that to to my uh, to my audience I think the good news is this is a, a massive fucking pain in the ass for the government that's the good news <laughs> if everyone's doing this like like even if you've got say 50 million Americans that are doing this 
And you can see the central planners trying to run around to all the CSI stuff to try to figure out their social score. Good luck with that. I mean, this, this is a, a, a massive task. So I think that in and of itself is good news, although it's not, it's not perfect. BJ, you want to chime in? Yeah, just something in your wheelhouse, uh, just quickly before you get back to you know, the topic at hand. Um, you mentioned, Chris mentioned property. And, you know, some of the Bitcoiners in here, and I've discussed it in spaces before, but, um, you know, one of my closest friends is a real estate immigration attorney in Miami, but he does, you know, high net worth and ultra high net worth, uh, mainly from Europe. And, you know, one day he messaged me, I don't know, eight months ago or something like that, telling me, you know, this Bitcoin thing that you're into, they now passed a law in the state of Florida that you can purchase and settle transactions in Bitcoin, and so I had to walk him through and tell him the, the, you know, explain how it worked, and this is how quickly it, it moves. So what he did, he had a client who wanted to buy property in Florida with Bitcoin for whatever for whatever reason. So he called the biggest underwriter in the state of Florida. I can't remember the name of it, and uh, but anybody in property would know it. And he said, "I have this client. This is the deal we want to do." And they said, "Okay, yes, we will do it." And but, you know, the fees or any taxes owed or stuff like that, that has to be done in fiat. But the price of the real estate can be settled in Bitcoin wallet to wallet. So then what he did is he called the second largest underwriter in the state of Florida and he said, these guys are willing to do it. And they said, OK, hold on, give us five minutes. They came back and they said, not only are we willing to do it, but we'll settle everything in bitcoin so now the money doesn't even have to go through his escrow account it makes it easier for the lawyer because now everything is transparent he could just put on the documentation look from this wallet from this wallet that was the value in satoshis versus fiat and that's it so it, it absolves him of any liability with his escrow account yeah. so that's something that new that's come down the pipeline and then the last thing i mentioned to people uh, a number of times in this room is because, you know, when I bought my truck uh, during COVID and I did it really to get away from all the nonsense of communist Canada to go to the States, um, I actually used my Bitcoin to secure the loan because they accepted it as a pristine asset. Mm -hmm. And I just had, you know, ample enough that they said, okay, that's fine. We'll give you the loan based on this. And so that was the first time I used Bitcoin it wasn't even for a transaction. It was just to secure a fiat loan. Yeah, that, that's the great the the great thing about transacting down here as far as real estate is although you'd have to have like the peso amount on the, the contract if you wanted to settle on, you could settle on whatever you want to settle on just so long as both parties sign on the dotted line. But uh, Luke, do you have a, a comment? Yeah, thanks, George. I was just going to add a couple things uh, regarding this. Yeah, I think I think all of them um, had great commentary on that. But I guess just two little short anecdotal things when it comes to privacy um, is first that uh, a lot of people actually don't know this, and this actually gets to the whole um, piece of concern that oh, only criminals use Bitcoin. Is actually that Hamas. Of course, a terrorist organization that attacked Israel. Um, actually, for a brief period of time, they were accepting donations in Bitcoin, um, and then they uh, refused then to accept donations in Bitcoin. So, I, I think it's um, pretty telling that even though Bitcoin is extremely privacy focused, that it's still traceable enough that um, you know if a terrorist organization is going to accept those donations, that literally the free market is going to then willingly not want to interact with them and then you know to the point where they don't want to accept it anymore and then i think the other interesting component too when it comes to that is that it doesn't even necessarily need to be non-kyc to have really really impactful implications um i think you know to bj's point about the truckers the only money they got was with bitcoin i think a really good example of that is um even kyc bitcoin um there were, there were some key agents like Nunchuck and a couple others, I believe, um, back during the trucker protests that, um, you know, had multi-sig vaults for Bitcoin. And because the Bitcoin was in multiple, or the, or the keys, 
for those vaults were in multiple jurisdictions, even though uh, the Canadian government could have uh, gotten a hold of one of those keys, the key within the jurisdiction of the Canadian government didn't have the ability to uh, take the actual Bitcoin. So anyway, I guess my little point there to wrap that up is that there's just a lot of options. And um, even if it's KYC Bitcoin, um, I think there's just a lot of flexibility there that many other assets just simply don't yeah. have. And then uh, uh, just to reiterate the point I made earlier, the resources necessary for the government to go after every single one of those people are just astronomical. That's a constraint. Yeah, the point the point of consolidation, I guess, is is and this is why, you know, it's been identified and I think like like Jeff Booth said, and it's I think it's a really good point, but there is there is twelve core sort of mining pools where all of the transactions are are effectively run through. And so again, what what it's important for I think um, you know Bit the Bitcoin community as a whole to recognise is is the importance and the value of decentralisation because if you have um, a small number of entities in effect verifying all the transactions and pushing them onto the blockchain, then you um, you you have a, you know potential for um, those those entities to be co-opted. Now, as as Jeff said, when that happens. What you what you find is the the free market identifies that's happening and 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 then moves its its hash rate um, to to alternative um, solutions and places that that ensure that it continues to be decentralised. And I think that's certainly Jeff's prognosis of what would happen if um, if there was a point of centralisation with the mining community. But that's that's again something that just really highlights why the key property and when you asked the other day around you know CBDCs having all of these properties that were kind of similar to Bitcoin and so you know what happens when the CBDCs come out with them what what they won't have is the, is the decentralization property which is absolutely core to what makes Bitcoin valuable. Okay, can I answer your question though, George? Because uh, sure. uh, the main thing that you're asking is, okay, how how difficult is it, and how much do they have to spend? And you're you're absolutely right that uh, if you do things properly, it's it gets very 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 difficult for the government to get them. But you know, generally the government is motivated uh, by you know different things. So, for example, you you had something like the Bitfinex hack in uh, 2017, uh, which they took years of very careful notes on like where the transactions went and so on, and then they finally found the people that did it, uh, and you know they're they're uh, on trial now and so on. Uh, so it, it is possible, and generally they'll they'll expend that much uh, the the level of resources necessary to catch people like that uh, only if they're like criminals. Right. Uh, if, if you're just like sort of a normal citizen, if you're buying coffee. Or even if you're buying a car with your Bitcoin, they're, they're not really that motivated to go do it. Now, that's not to say you're not going to get a malicious prosecutor that wants to do it and will spend all sorts of uh, public resources in a frivolous way to try to catch somebody. That's, uh, I'm not saying that at all. But generally, the amount of money that you have to spend, amount of resources that you have to spend to de-anonymize something uh, is, is significant uh, and, you know, only the large amounts are generally worthwhile. Yeah, and I'm just looking at this right now. I'm, I'm, I mean, I want to look at it from several different ways moving forward. But right now, just from the standpoint of someone just not wanting the government to know what the hell they're doing. And, uh, you know, maybe that's a social score, whatever reason you had. Yeah, I remember growing up as a kid in the 1970s. And I don't know how old you guys are, if any of you can relate to this. But my father, and just a personal story here, my father, when I was born, was 59 years old. So I was born in 1973, and my dad was 59, my mom was 32, and my dad actually flew planes in World War II in the Philippines. He was shot down three times. He was born in Tennessee in 1914, believe it or not. That was my father, not my grandfather. And I just remember... The, the relationship my father had with cash and the, and the attitude back then toward privacy was totally, it's, it was like a 180 degree difference. I know now when I go to a bank like Wells Fargo, 
you know, you go to deposit like a hundred dollar bill and they're asking you 15,000 questions as where'd you get that hundred dollar bill? What do you do for a living? You know, oh, you know, I saw you drive up on Mercedes. Where'd you get that? <laughs> it's like, what the fuck is it of your business? And I remember that if you would have asked my father, if he would have deposited $10,000 in cash, and if, and if the person would have asked him where he got that money, he would have lost his mind. He would have gone completely off the rails. I mean, that, that he, I, you know, my father really didn't use profanity that much. But in that case, he probably would have got the manager and just read them the, 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 the riot act. And it's just the, the relationship. So moving forward, I think that hopefully people will start to have that attitude again. And I'm just trying to figure out the best solution uh, for those types of patriots or Americans or, or rebels or whatever you want to call them that just say, look, you know, it's just my right for the government not to know what the hell I'm doing. And it doesn't mean I'm doing anything bad or nefarious or I'm an evil or I'm a criminal or a terrorist. It's just, no, it's none of your fucking business. BJ, jump in, man. Yeah, I think it's just because there was an option that allowed him privacy. My, my father, my grandparents were the exact same way. However, as life had changed, started with the bank machines and digitization of banking, it just became convenient and there was no perceived risk of having that convenience. But now that's changing. You know, one of my brothers runs one of the largest pension funds in Canada. And I remember asking him when I was, when I was young, when I was a teenager, I was crossing the border for the, fir- the border for the first time on my own. And I said, so what do I say when I go up the booth? He's, if they ask me, what are you going here? For, he said, tell them it's none of their effing business. Mm, yeah. Okay, well, here we are 30 years later, and he's as compliant as everybody else because they don't see an option. You know, there's somebody in this room by the name of Risa. Risa was following us during the convoy. She came to um, Ottawa. She is the epitome of a normie. Like, she's a normie normie in suburban Toronto. But she was horrified, as many people were, because people don't know, we had a $1.2 trillion bank run the week that they froze our accounts. That's why they stopped the EMA. But she's one of many people that I met on here, on Spaces, who was curious about Bitcoin because of what the government did. And it was the trigger moment that they said, okay, this is too much, too much involvement in my life. And now we're, you know, a couple of a couple of years later, there she's she's clicking 100%. She now has a node. I think she has a miner. She's teaching other women in her neighborhood about Bitcoin, trying to bring them on to show them that no, you know what? You do have an option that's going to give you privacy. Is it perfect? Nothing in the universe is perfect. But it's the best thing we got right now, I think. Yeah. Jimmy, you got a comment? Yeah, so um, basically uh, what I wanted to say about that, uh, that like sort of getting away from cash and uh, all the um, sort of like privacy values that people used to have and how it degraded, uh, the reason for that is because they made everything free, right? Like, and this this is, uh, or at least to the consumer. So for example, with credit cards and stuff, they made things extremely convenient and for that convenience, we give up our privacy on our transactions. Now, people weren't necessarily doing this consciously, but this is the trade-off that everyone made. Uh, and, you know, in the digital world, this is even worse uh, because, you know, everything that you buy online has, like, uh, records all over the place and so on. So, um, you know, as we've gotten things for free, we, we've gotten much more complacent because we think it's, uh, it doesn't cost anything, but it does. It costs your privacy. Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, th- this was the thing that a lot of the cypherpunks back in, you know, 92, 93, all the way on, uh, were really concerned with because they, they thought this was exactly what would happen, that everyone would give up their privacy for a little more convenience, a, a few more things and things like that. Um, I want to share with you just like a short story uh, that I, I heard from, uh, you know, somebody that you wouldn't expect. Uh, Taeyong Ho is... 
the highest ranking North Korean defector um, that, that's come out. I, I had the privilege of speaking to him a few years ago at the Oslo Freedom Forum. And, uh, and one of the things that he pointed out to me was that, uh, you know, Kim, Kim Il-sung wasn't necessarily that popular when he first came into power in North Korea. Uh, but he became popular as a result of promising lots of free things. So he said, you're going to get free health care, you're going to get a house, you're going to have a job, you're going to get this and that and everything else. And he said, well, you know, that, that uh, was a way to get, uh, get popularity, but it also had like a secondary effect, which was that at a certain point, if you want all of these free things, they realized that this was an important lever to push to get people to comply with various things. So, for example, if you're not completely for the North Korean Communist Party, uh, then, you know, you don't have a right to a house or health care or anything like that. In fact, they'll go throw you in the gulag. Dependency. Dependency. And the thing that he said to me that... Right, right. The thing that he said to me that was really profound was, this is why market transactions are so important. You should be paying for stuff because there's an obligation to you by the other party. If you don't have a market transaction, you're paying with your compliance. Mm. And that made me think, wow, okay, what am I getting for free? And I, at the time I was thinking, you know, I, I get Gmail for free. I get Facebook for free. I get Twitter for free. What am I paying? Oh, like, how am I paying? Well, the obvious re uh, thing that, you're get, uh, that they're getting out of it is your compliance to their terms and conditions. And this is why they were able to do some of the things that they did, uh, you know, with, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of in information suppression and things like that during COVID and during the election and so on. So it, it's some, uh, that, that convenience is ultimately what causes this laxity about privacy. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think that's what will draw people to a CBDC. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And, and that's how they're going to spin it is, uh, you know, they uh, like, for example, they had the stimmy checks go out to everybody. And it was like a lot of uh, a big mess. So they'll uh, trot out some statistics saying like so many such and such people were really poor and didn't get their stimmy checks because they didn't have a bank account and they had to go to a uh, payday loan lender or a check cashing place and lose 10 percent of it. These are the people that needed it the most. If we had a CBDC, then they would all have checking accounts and they, they, we can just deposit it to them straight. What they don't tell you is that they can also keep track of how you're spending that money. And, uh, and they can take away some of that money if, uh, if, they don't, if, if they think you don't need it. Right now, they can kind of do that anyway. Um, they just deputize banks to do it, but it's a more painful procedure for a lot of these uh, uh, you know, government agencies, so, so they don't use this weapon nearly as much as they would if it were a CBDC, but that, that's, that's the real danger. Yeah, here. Jimmy, I think the features as well. So, like the other day when I got that Bitcoin peer-to-peer, -peer, we just did it through my, my, web, my webcam, and I think for the average Joe, they're going to be able to do that with their CBDC, and they're going to think that is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and that's just going to you know, get them further engaged in that CBDC network. So it's the stimmies, it's the free money, and it's the uh, features like the instant settlement and the QR code stuff. I think they're going to be rolling out all of that in advance of a social score. And then once they get everyone hooked into the network, then they'll start rolling out the, the uh, Orwellian stuff. Yeah, so I, one thing I would say is sort of like a force uh, going the other way on CBDCs in the legacy system. Um, the whole point of a CBDC is so that everyone has a direct account at the central bank, right? It's called a central bank digital currency for that reason. Right now, most, uh, you know, fiat-backed, uh, uh, you know, banking systems or monetary systems operate with the central bank with lots of member banks, and those member banks are the ones that actually serve the customer. So what you would end, essentially end up doing by introducing a CBDC is cutting out all of those middlemen. And that that's a lot of money right there, right? Like there, there's a lot of different, um, uh, you know, banks and stuff that have their lobbies and so on. This is why it's a lot easier for, say, 
a country like China to do it because they don't really care. They don't, uh, you know, like they don't have to satisfy the banking lobby. The banking lobby have, has to satisfy them. Uh, but at least in a, in a democracy and somewhere where you have lots of voters, um, you know, a lot of these banks, people don't realize, employ enormous amounts of people. So Citibank, for example, ha employs like 220,000 people in the United States. So like that's not a small constituency and you can't afford to necessarily piss them off. So while uh, it is like sort of advantage government in almost every regard, there, there are sort of like, ironically enough, uh, banks will be kind of allies in that in that regard and uh, sort of resisting some of that. And that's that's why it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, so here's where I might be able to offer a little insight. The way the mechanics will work with the, the CBDC is simply just taking the commercial bank deposit liabilities from the bank's balance sheet over to the central bank, uh, to your point. But it doesn't mean that they the banks miss out on any profit uh, opportunities. And when we look at the uh, the sandbox, which is what the SWIFT is calling their new system that they're saying they're going to roll out in 12 to 24 months, uh, we see that a lot of banks were on board with this. And if you think about it through the lens of HSBC or Deutsche or JP Morgan or Citi, it makes a lot of sense. Because right now the way, or the way they're supposed to make money, is by creating currency units that didn't exist before by lending them into existence. So now they have a deposit liability, and then they also have an offsetting asset, which is the loan that was just created. But in doing so, they take on quite a bit of risk that that person won't pay them back. But in a CBDC world, uh, the only thing that happens are the deposit liabilities now exist on the Fed's balance sheet instead of the commercial bank. So the commercial bank still initiates the loan, uh, but that person, those currency units, go into their account that are on the Fed's balance sheet, and the loan goes onto the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet, but the bank themselves still gets the profit as a intermediary doing that transaction that the Fed would have otherwise had to have done. And I think that's why, you know, they're going to make the same amount of money, but they've got none of the risk. And I think that's why when you see all of these uh, CBDC programs, the at least the big banks are totally, totally on board with it. Now, to your point, Jimmy, the smaller banks, that it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. That's for sure. Um, and I think a lot of this, as far as timing, is going to be all about a financial crisis or a banking crisis where you know we see what's happening with the regional banks right now, and they're really struggling. Uh, if the Fed wanted to move this uh, forward as far as a timeline, they could just start letting those banks fail. All those deposits will go onto J.P. Morgan's balance sheet. You consolidate those deposits onto a few banks, and then it's really easy to bring them onto the Fed's balance sheet, and uh, and then you've got them basically on on one ledger. So that's kind of how I see it playing out a little differently. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do wonder though what what they're going to do when. It, like it, what, what, what you're saying, I think, is that you get you still get like the loan origination fees and things like that, which is how banks operate right now. Anyway, they uh, they make a loan and then they sell it out into the market um, like they, they still they still have that juice. Um, I, I do wonder, though, there there's a significant amount of redundancy after that. Right. So uh, it, I, I'm sure the bank CEOs are thinking, OK, well, we can make a lot more money because we can eliminate all of these departments. Well, what, where did all those people go? I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, the you know these are people in the banking sector. They, they don't really have other skills other than being good at banking uh, and usually very esoteric systems that are not really used anywhere else. I don't like, think they're... Do, I, they, do they have somewhere to go? I don't go? think they're eliminating they, anyone, though. Like, who would they eliminate? Well, I mean, you're, you're not going to need, uh, you know, like uh, electronic systems to keep the ledger on your thing because you're, you're just passing through the, to the Fed CBDC well, now, right? Like, they've, so, still got a, they've still got a ledger. It's just their ledger would interact with the Federal Reserve and the, the, the Federal Reserve's ledger 
would be kind of the, the, the unified ledgers, but it's getting inputs from all the other banks. So I could be I could be wrong there, but I, I think they'll pretty much it's like business as usual. And in my in, okay. in my view, I think it'll be very similar to just the way a mortgage is originated now with like Wells Fargo. Like to your point, they they're that thing's done before the ink's dry. And it's just going over to Fannie and Freddie and then they're turning into a, a mortgage back security or something like that. That Wells Fargo rarely keeps that on their balance sheet. Now, the small community banks, they absolutely do. But uh, that would be an example of kind of how I think the majority of the loans are going to work moving forward. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I, I was thinking more like Chinese-style CBDCs where you have one Uber ledger and everyone has an account with them. Uh, instead of uh, sort of what, what yours sounds like is maybe more Western style CBDC where you have intermediary banks still that have, um, you know, their own ledgers and own, uh, still maybe like customer deposits and stuff. No, and your account, maybe your the, account still you know, the Federal Reserve. But what happens is you go down oh. to, even though your account is a liability of the Fed, and I don't know, maybe they'll just say that mm -hmm. it's not, you know, I mean, who knows what they'll call it. But from a mechanical standpoint, your account still is with the Fed, just because they're doing it with bank reserves, just like J.P. Morgan has an account with the Fed. And what happens, though, is if you need that car loan, you're not going to go to Jerome Powell. You're going to go down to your local Wells Fargo, and you're going to say, hey, I need a car loan. And they're going to go through their checklist, just like they do with Fannie and Freddie. And the underwriting is kind of centralized. And then they'll say, okay, you can go ahead and approve this car loan to buy a, a $50,000 car or whatever it is. And then they say, great. So then that money is created from scratch in your account, but your account is at the Federal Reserve, and they're doing that with base money. And then the offsetting asset is going to be the loan that was created by Wells Fargo, but that asset now is on the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet, not Wells Fargo. And then the Fed just deposits the money, the profit, or the finder's fee, if you will, the origination fee, into the reserve account of Wells Fargo. So the, 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 the face of the transaction was through the commercial bank, although the account and then the liability and offsetting asset is on the Fed's balance sheet. I see. So do you, do you see like um, like the normal things that you do at a bank, like um, you know deposit a check or something like that, just passing all the way through to the Fed as yes. well? Or yes. would you... Okay. Yeah. Um, in that case, I guess, I guess you, you, you could, like, eliminate some of that stuff uh, at a bank, right? Like, because you, you, don't, you don't need to, um, like, uh, a, a lot of the reserve requirements and stuff, if, if it's at the Fed, then you don't need to worry about that as sort of like, yeah, I guess you, every bank would be sort of like the, um, like, uh, you know, somebody that's the face of the Fed, if you will. They're, they're sort of extensions of the Fed more explicitly than they exactly. are. Exactly. Exactly. And I think all the major banks are pretty much run by the government anyway. I mean, when you look at Dodd-Frank and you look at all the regulation, I mean, as well as Fargo at the end of the day, really any different than uh, Bank of America. I think they're all one and the same. But that's just my opinion uh, based on kind of how the mechanics work and what I see as the path of least resistance. This is a messy process and it, can tr it could turn out uh, a little bit different. You know, I'm not sure. But, but I, I think one thing I'm very confident in is the CBDC network, that is not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. DJ, you want to... Yeah, I think that now is something like... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jimmy. I, I was just saying, the Fed, Fed now is sort of like the base for that, I think, is, is what a lot of people are thinking. Yeah, it's the infrastructure for those transactions going back and forth and communicating with the, the, the different ledgers. And, um, you know, we, don't, uh, we haven't even talked about tokenizing assets. I think that's uh, another thing that uh, they're going to be in control of. BJ, you got a comment? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm still on team no CBDC, but... You know, I could be wrong, and I understand your argument as well, uh, but something to add to this, this might be, you know, for your side of the debate. Uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I was down in Florida, and I don't know if, if you guys heard about it where you are, 
Well, there were some banking disruptions for about a week, uh, predominantly with people that were traveling from Canada to the U.S. And I happened to be down in Florida with a lady friend at the time who was a chief of staff for one of our elected representatives. And she got a call from her boss that uh, there was, it was a cabinet member, that there was a major banking problem as was described and apparently what happened was there's in Canada I don't know about the US but in Canada developers are they're really the wealthiest people in the country and so one of the development companies one of the large development companies here was trying to do a massive transfer from I guess their parent company to one of their subsidiaries or multiple subsidiaries and it was hundreds of millions of dollars and they were part of the TD Bank network. And apparently the transaction failed. There was a liquidity problem. And that just had a ripple effect across the entire banking system here. And it ended up in certain people, depending where you banked, you couldn't withdraw money for three or four days. We're driving all over the state of Florida, trying different banks where you can get money, just couldn't get, um, couldn't get anything going. And the cabinet members on the provincial levels and on the federal levels, their solution was, okay, just don't tell the media. <laughs> tell, tell the bank, you don't tell anybody, we won't tell anybody, and let's wait it out for a few days, and maybe it'll work out. That, that's the level of competency we have in, in our governments. And I'm just wondering if that's lent itself to FedNow, and if that adds to your prediction of a CBDC, is that going to solve this problem or not? I'm just curious your... And then the second question I wanted to ask you, is this the motivation, aside from a whiteboard video, are you getting very serious about Bitcoin because you are getting legitimately worried about a CBDC and that's kind of your line in the sand that, okay, I got to get off this crazy town. If it's Bitcoin or whatever... I just got to get away from it. Is that what's fueling it? I'm trying to find out solutions for my audience. And I'm trying to help people. That, that, In three simple steps. Yeah, that, that's really what this is all about. And I think that there's no certainties, but very high probabilities that we get the CBDC. And I'm just trying to figure out how the hell people can navigate this while maximizing their privacy, freedom and, and liberty and all those things that we you know, value. So that's really the, the motivator for me. And a lot of people out there, I'm sure you guys know this, I think they get very complacent. A lot of the gold guys, a lot of the Bitcoin guys or silver guys, whatever, and they say, oh, who cares about a CBDC? Number one, they don't think it's ever going to happen because no one's going to want it. And uh, I think they'll definitely want it. Uh, but number two, they say, well, even if there is a CBD, oh, who cares? I'll just uh, go down to the local hardware store and I'll just pay for everything with my silver coins or my gold coins. Or yeah, Look, <laughs> okay, you, you might have a few people that will take it, but that is not a, a realistic solution. It might be for a couple transactions here and there, but not for the majority of your payments, and especially if you want to avoid the government knowing what you're doing or if you want to avoid a social score. I think the social score also is going to be very, very important moving forward because I think they're going to basically use it like a credit score where it'll determine whether or not you get a loan and it will likely determine your interest rate as well. So you know, these are, I think, really important things to think through. And if COVID taught me anything, it's that you need to plan for this stuff in advance. Like, you, you, you can't just be reactionary because then you're making all these decisions with emotion and you're just going to, it's going to lead to bad decision making. And so I'm just trying to really think through this stuff as much as I can to, and then that's another reason why I'm going to Argentina. And it's one thing to sit there and think about it and whiteboard it, but it's another thing to actually live it for a week. And that's what's going to teach me the most for sure. And then after that, you know, come to some conclusions as to how people can prepare and how people can proceed to the best of their ability.
Yeah, Luke, you want to... Should we, we should just quickly... Uh, Pob- Pobby's come up to the stage and not said anything yet, so sure, uh, sure. maybe jump to Pobby and then and then Luke, if that's all right with you, George. Sure. Yeah, guys, yeah, thanks for having me up. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I remember the simple times when everyone just uh, bought Bitcoin for number go up technology. <laughs> you know, all this pre-2020. Pre, pre and what it, what's interesting is it unfolds every year just another use case for Bitcoin, another use case. And you see what unfolds in Venezuela. You see what unfolds in in, in Lebanon and hyperinflation. And oh, what if we had only put that in Bitcoin? Or you see folks trying to flee their country um, that can't take gold, can't take anything with them. Well, they could have their Bitcoin. And now what we've seen, especially uh, since since COVID hit, uh, you know, these continual lockdowns, um, I had the pleasure to get to uh know and meet bj over the years and and to see that's i mean the one thing that really um sort of set me over the top in the preparing was man when you when they're just you can go out and just freeze a bank account and freeze a credit card all the value that you'd put in your life is just 100 percent gone, 100% gone. Yeah. And when you're and you're looking at um a mom and pop shop that had the audacity to serve coffee and croissants to truckers and they start freezing their accounts and going to and I'm thinking, man, I, I don't have to have 100% of this into Bitcoin, but I better have a percentage because even, I don't care what the fees are in Bitcoin. I don't care if it's 20, 30. I, I'd rather keep 60% of my value than lose all of it. And you're, you're touching the right points, man, with the, the UBI that's coming down um, th- through the CBDCs. Uh, you're looking at a history of automation. You're looking at AI that's coming out in a population that is going to get harder and harder to justify their jobs and what are they going to want? As we said, something easy. Here you go. Here's some free money. You know, he catches. Here's how you can spend it. When you can spend it. It's like the digital wand. Oh, you didn't spend all of your your UBI money. I guess you really didn't need it. So we're going to, we're going to take some of that back. And this is where we're moving. And I would just implore anyone. Um, you're looking through here. This is why this now's the time that you build these side economies. So carbon credit score. I'm going to go out to the grocery store one day. And I'm going to buy a pound of, you know, a steak, nice steak. I'm going to go back out in two weeks and I'm going to get flagged on my card saying, hey, listen, uh, you already had a pound of steak. That is your limit. Well, thankfully, since I know, you know, Texas Slim in the Beef Initiative, he and I, we, guess what? We got a side channel lined up here on Lightning. OK, so I can buy a beef from him. It's just it's another layer of privacy, another layer in a way of of getting around it. It's not perfect, of course. The government can track a lot, of the, especially on 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 chain payments. But as you mentioned, it is so difficult to do right now with what they have and is coming. So I would just implore anyone for all of these reasons. Uh, it's going to be a personal choice, but you should have some exposure to Bitcoin. Yeah, I always say that I think the the value is almost the least interesting thing, or the price is the least interesting thing about Bitcoin. Although I, I may adjust that view because I think market cap is so damn important uh, in terms of volatility. But what I'm really trying to solve for right now is the transactional component of it and the privacy. I, I think as far as the digital store of value long term, as far as the transportability, I think those are, are, are very obvious. It's more so just the the privacy in the transactions. That's kind of what I'm trying to solve for right now. And then to BJ's point, I think one of the great tools or one of the great weapons that we have fighting for us is the incompetence of the government and the central planners. (laughs) So maybe we can rest easy at night knowing that they're just complete buffoons. But I do think at some point in time they'll figure it out. Luke, you want to chime in? Yeah, um, to that point about the buffoonery, I mean, yeah, I, I think, I, I agree with you. Sometimes it's like, are they even malicious? Are they just all jokesters? But in, in the end, it, I don't think it really matters because arguably it could even be Yeah, the net result is still the same, right? The power they have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, then the result's still the same. Um, yeah, no, I, I was just going to comment on uh, what you said about trying to find solutions uh, for the viewers, and I think PubLord added some good comments, too. I, I think a lot of this just comes down to uh, trade-offs, and that everything has trade-offs, right? We started out the conversation talking about 
layer one versus layer two, I think that's got trade-offs. Um, and then I think, you know, if people listening are looking for solutions, I think there are, you know, different, I, I think hopefully the takeaway for people is that when it comes to Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin itself has trade-offs compared to, you know, traditional fiat money, right, CBDCs. Um, but then also even within Bitcoin, there are different trade-offs too, right? So obviously, you know, there's the non-KYC route that, you know, single SIG, and then, you know, again, there's the multi-SIG route where someone could, like, have jurisdictional arbitrage and have keys in different places, right? And, of course, again, everything has its own trade-offs, and so hopefully, you know, that I guess that's my encouragement for people is that, you know, I, I've been Bitcoin a little while, and I've, I've, I really looked at everything, and that's just the lesson that keeps coming to my mind, right? So if people are learning about this, I, I just encourage them to consider the trade-offs of every option and kind of know going in from the get-go that there's not going to be really a straightforward option that solves all your problems and it's probably best to have a little bit of exposure um, to everything in that regard. Um, and then, oh shoot, was the other thing I was going to say. Um, yeah, I, sp I suppose that's my main point there. Uh, just that there's different trade-offs there. And, then, and I guess the one other thing too with what you said, George, about this, the, the price, like, I fully agree with that. The price is the least interesting aspect of Bitcoin. And I think if Bitcoin's going to be used by a lot more people, like, if it's going to get more adoption in the future, I think the whole, you know, me of exchange slash, you know, transactions, privacy, freedom, let's say, um, I think that's going to be the much larger um, adopting factor than the store value part, right? Because the store value part has, you know, volatility. A lot of people don't have the time horizon necessary or anything. But I think, you know, the people that come into Bitcoin relatively new are pretty focused on number go up in price. But I think the longer one has been into Bitcoin and focused on Bitcoin, I think the more they realize that the price doesn't matter. And then beyond that, I think that's where if, if there's going to be a massive or, or a significant spike in adoption, I think it's actually going to be from the payments and transaction rails, not the not the number go up rails. Although, you know, that does come in boom and busts, right? Yeah. So, so anyway, trade-offs. Yeah, right? thanks for those comments, Luke. I want to get over to Ragnar. Before we do, Publord, can you do me a favor? and Or can someone explain what you were talking about when you were referring to buying beef? And you said you were setting up something on layer two to where you could do that with complete privacy. Well, I, I, I don't know if it's complete privacy. Uh, what, I, what I'm sort of referring to is the ultimate tie-in of, like we were talking about, the t your social credit score and then also it will be your, your carbon credit score where yeah, yeah. you're going to be limited into, um, you're going to go to grocery store and every package is going to say, oh, this is how many carbon credits uh, th this cost. And Agreed. this is a lot, and this is how much uh, you're going to be allotted every month. So you can you can order that pound of steak now, or you can order you know your your four ounces you know once a week or whatever it is. And when you have something set up, and and they can shut down, they'll shut that down easily if you're using UBI, you're using um, any type of your your credit card. But uh, if if you have something, um, you know, and I use Texas Slim as an example, you know, he does his beach initiative and. A lot of people that are accepting Bitcoin for payment now on you know the on chain is easy, but if he and I set up, uh, you know, I equate the um, it's, it's it's a bit simplistic, but uh, you know when you when the two of us open up a Lightning channel or payment rail, um, the, there's only two two items that show up on chain is how much you and I put up there to establish it, but in between it's like go you go you're going out to eat, you go up to a bar and. You're not going to run your credit card. I want a beer. Credit card. Oh, nachos. Credit card. Oh, give me margarita. Credit card. No, what's nice with this is, real simple, is you run the tab. And that's really what the late network is. I know it's net, net that settlement. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's the, and, and you go back and forth and back and forth. And this is something that you can well establish with your farmers and ranchers as we talk about other food sources, clothing sources. Because, you know, that's one of the, the West jokes is, you know, you'll have nothing and you'll get this many outfits per year. Well, guess what? Maybe I want a little more than that. Now, the privacy is the part, um, obviously, but it just makes it more difficult for them to track this. But this is just a, a, a good parallel. I, I wouldn't maybe call it, well, maybe it is a black market economy in a way. But I, I think, uh, you know, Bitcoin and Lightning Network like this are really conducive to, 
to you being able to skirt the system for a while at least. And, and, and in order to do what you were saying, you said to, you have to set up a channel on layer two. He, he was talking about he was talking about a specific layer two called lightning and uh, and it works kind of the way that you were saying there's a technical netting that happens on chain. Uh, but like while you're doing um, you know multiple transactions, you have it from party A to party B. Uh, but you could also do party A to party B to party C and then net, net all that out. And that's basically how the night, Lightning Network Okay, so that's going way. to help us with um, so convenience, yeah. speed, and price. It's going to definitely lower the price. Right, because you, you, because you don't need to uh, settle everything on chain and pay those fees. You just have, like, the riding fees and stuff. Does that like help that. us so with, the, a, does that help um, with the privacy, uh, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. It also helps with the privacy because... Uh, uh, you like it's not on chain, so the data isn't there for you to analyze. Uh, and the people in between the hops between A and B, like if there's like C, D, and E in between, they would know a little bit of information, but not that much. Uh, but they don't necessarily know who's who, who the either endpoint is if they're in the middle. So the hops one. between are the entities that are managing, for lack of a better word, the actual transactions yeah. on the Lightning Network or that netting process. That yeah, yeah. So they're they're called routing nodes. Uh, so basically, they're they're there to provide liquidity between people, and they get paid some small fee to do that. And you know that that's another whole business that people get into is running routing nodes. And still very early, but uh, you know, like a lot of people think this is like the closest thing to like a risk free rate of return because you can uh, store Bitcoin on there, and you're just providing liquidity to people and you make money doing mm, it so okay. that that's that's what i'm doing all right ragnar you want to chime in uh, thank you george chris and amazing space um i i just have some you know some questions and also a comment like i i come from nigeria right and we had a cbdc recently i don't want to take us back you know but i just want to make a comment based on you know the conclusions we came to previously we had a cbdc which which failed woefully um as the nigerian government ruled it out it was intended for the central banks to have you know basically the accounts of everybody in the country and when you register you download this app the e naira and if you have a direct account to the central bank and the central bank knows what you do, monitors your spendings, your incomes and, uh, you know, outcome, your taxes and everything. This failed woefully. And um, we, we begin to ask ourselves why. Like, I, so this is su successful in China, right? I find it, I, I find that it's going to be actually very difficult. I sit in the camp of those who think it may be very difficult for this thing to roll out in the West. And Nigeria is a good example. When you come to the Nigerian banking system, there is something that banks call deals. That is how they make a lot of their money. Most of their money is made through individuals in the banks doing individual deals with companies and individuals for loans. Now, if everything is shifted to the, C uh, to the central bank, like you said, so the banks will be like intermediaries, they will initiate loans, but all the risk is going to be taken back to central banks. In, in that situation, like what Jimmy Song said, the banks will lose a lot of their influence on society. And I don't think these big banks would like to see that. That is my, the first point. They will, you know, we know what happens when risk is taken off banks. You know, uh, the, the Fed is usually a backstop for most of the risk. They, they, take, they take a lot of risk during booms, you know, give all sorts of, give all sorts of loans, you know, over leverage themselves. And when the bust comes, the bank, the, the central bank is like a backstop. Now, if the central bank is going to take all those uh, risk onto themselves, I, who monitors what the banks or the rates of, the, to the extent of the risk that the banks can take by giving people loans and making credit of it? I think Secondly, it's underwritten. The, uh, the, yeah, it's the, underwritten the, like Fannie and Freddie. I'm sorry to cut you off there. Okay, okay let me just finish the second point. The second point I wanted to say is that... Um, like, I think this starting this system will be a huge advertisement for Bitcoin. And I'll give you a reason why I'm saying so. 
in Nigeria also, we, we of course you keep hearing things like Nigeria is um, one of the countries that adopts Bitcoin. The you know one of the when you talk about Bitcoin adoption, Nigeria is up there. The the fact I'm going to drop to you guys here now is not the ordinary people. Most of the capital that are entering Bitcoin in Nigeria come from shady politicians, actually. So if this happens, because the, the central bank, the CBDC is going to be a kind of system where everybody's transactions are open. The people who have the highest amount of shit to hide are the cantillonaires and politicians. So we are going to push them into Bitcoin. And, and this is not a joke. A lot of a lot of a lot of politicians in Nigeria are buying huge amounts of Bitcoin because they do not want their shady deals to be obvious. So just imagine what the Biden crime family. After the CBDC comes, what do you want them to do? How do you want them to move money to Ukraine? How do you want all these cantillonaires to operate in a central banking digital system where Powell has an eye into what everybody is doing? It is a big advertisement for Bitcoin and everybody will look for an alternative because everybody has incentive to keep their transactions private, especially these very shady people who fly to islands to touch little children. I see an, an, a, a, an important you know, role for Bitcoin to play in hiding people's transactions. That is my own submission. I, I mean, that, those are incredible insights. Very, very good points. Ragnar, can you expand on why the people rejected the CBDC in Nigeria? What well, the first of all is that people people do not like I said. Okay, first of all is that you have bank deals. The banks in Nigeria see the e naira as something that is coming to take away business from them. So I don't know how many Nigerians are listening to this, but you know, Nigerians can tell you most banks, how the workers, the, like the top executives in the banks and, you know, even the mid-level executives, how they, it's not their salary that makes them, you know, what they are. Most of them do deals with government entities, with corporations, with and private individuals for loans. And the kind of cut they get from those um, deals is huge. And when the e naira was coming forth, they, so these banks and, and um, Nigerians and, and the banks that bank them see the central banks like bureaucrats that don't know really much about how the economy works, but want to take everybody's balance and keep it. So people did not, you know, it, it didn't um, like people didn't think it was something reasonable and they didn't want to play to it. Secondly, a lot of people are becoming aware of the facts. That's the e era will monitor everything you do. So, first of all, is that people like us and people associated with, like me and my family, the first thing I told my family is don't even go and look for that app. Like, if you see any message, your bank's sending you any message, delete the message immediately. Don't even initiate because they, they will offer you some things to say, oh, when you download this app, you may be given a set a different interest rate, or you may be given like um, a thousand naira to boost as a balance on that. You know, they, they will draw you in. And I told my family, don't even, you know, download this in the first place because they want to get your data and get how you spend. So this message, of course, some people. I think about one point five. It it it, it rose till about one point five of the population, or zero point five, if I'm not mistaken downloaded this app but right now it is not working also the app itself failed you know the worst people to do anything technical is government of course we all know that so they can't even get it right they can't get their messed up blockchain together they can't you know even though they they, they even had to go outside nigeria to get foreign you know tech tech guys to come and work on it they still could not get it working so there, there are many reasons why this did not work both technical both the people being aware, and because it was going to take a lot of risky business, risky but profitable business from banks, and because of that, a lot of people, even the, the politicians themselves, they know that that is not what they want to do, because they want to have private banks that they can do their deals without it getting out there. That is what I actually think happened. 
Mm, wow, that is. Thank you for sharing that. That is super, super interesting. And you know, maybe there's room for optimism there. Uh, I, I'm totally open to being wrong about the probabilities uh, that we do get a CBDC. And based on what you said, maybe, maybe the probability is a hell of a lot lower than I thought. Ragnar, in, ter in terms of the Nigerian people versus people in the West, do you think that the, 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 the populace in those countries are less brainwashed into doing as they're told <laughs> because it very much feels to me like uh, covid opened my eyes to people that i thought were very intelligent kind of you know self-motivated go-getters suddenly um turned into to uh, yeah barring sheep um so I'd, I'd love to hear your view on whether or not you think society and culture cultural differences um could could potentially see a different outcome in the West. I think yeah yeah I, we've talked about this before and in the in, in in the global south there is a huge distrust for the government so people don't believe a lot of things you know our governments are just like local terrorists was they come around once in a while take your money and flee they don't provide anything there, there are no social services then. That basically, the nanny states you have in the West doesn't exist anywhere in the global south. So because of that, there is no trust for government. You just see government as people who are very ineffective, but they come around once in a while to force you to do some things and to take tax taxes from you. So people, the starting point is distrust for the government. And th that is why it is very easy to go to the global south and tell someone, there is this money that is called Bitcoin, you can use it to import goods from China, even though your government is saying you cannot, you shouldn't hold dollars. They've inflated our money by 1,400% within a short while. However, you, can st you still cannot hold dollars to protect your purchasing power. So when you tell somebody like this, oh, there is Bitcoin, it doesn't take so much to understand. But when I see people from the West, you know, so, you know, when you have a nanny state, you are being pampered, and um, the, your government is good, and a, a huge mass of people in the West still think, you know, even though we are here on this call, a lot of people from the West who have opened their eyes to see that we are all being raped, you know, basically, but still a huge population, a huge mass of people in the West still believe that, oh, government gets it right, we just need to change the group of people who are in charge, you know, if we can take out the Democrats and bring in the Republicans or, or otherwise, or the Tories like you hear in the UK, you know, a lot of people still have hope in these people. And that is why I feel that CBDCs may be adopted more than it is, than it was in Nigeria. But I still think it will eventually fail because the guys who will, who are supposed to push it onto the people, so it's either they will have a separate system for themselves. You know, that's another thing I wanted to bring up. Is it possible they could have a separate system for themselves so that their transactions are not visible and they can keep doing what they're doing while pushing the general CBDCs onto the unfortunate poor masses? That is another alternative. Because the masses in the West, I see them as very gullible and they can yeah. buy most of this stuff. Well, that, that's why I think UBIs are a massive threat for that exact reason, because I think, you know, in, in, in almost the same way as we're, we're not going to force you to take the vaccine, but you can't travel, you can't go to nightclubs, you can't do X, Y, Z. It's, it's, it's kind of like we're not forcing you. Uh, it's optional. But, you know, um, it, it, I suppose on the social credit system, um, people are, are, are looking to be given money. And so, you know, there's the phrase beggars can't be choosers, which is maybe not necessarily appropriate, but you, you take the point in so much as that, that there isn't much choice. If you want um, funds to sustain yourself, then this is the mechanism through which you will receive um, those funds. So interested to hear your thoughts on that, George, because in the UK, certainly there's, there's two, uh, UBIs that I'm aware of being trialled where I think £1,600 is being given for nothing to just see how they behave with those funds. A couple things. If I'm Jerome Powell, 
or I'm just using him as a proxy for the group of people that would want to roll this out in the United States or the West, I would be hyper-focused on why it didn't work in Nigeria. And I'd be looking at all the other systems that tried this, and I would ask myself, what did they do right? What they did? What did they do wrong? How did the people themselves respond to this? And then I would iterate from there. And when I, so as an example, when Ragnar was talking about the CBDC that they rolled out, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ragnar, but the central bank called it something different. It was George, George, can, I, can I interrupt for a second? Sorry, I've just had a message from Jimmy um, who has to go. So I just wanted you uh, and me also to have an opportunity to just say uh, thank you for joining us, Jimmy. Really appreciated your, your input. Absolutely. Yeah, Jimmy, thanks a lot for coming uh, on. I, it was great talking to you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, hopefully you guys uh, figure out what's going on with CBDCs and uh, you can let me know. Later. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Doc. Um, and also welcome, Mechanic. We'll come, we'll come to you shortly. There, there's uh, lots of people requesting. So just um, FYI, um, there was a number of people that I reached out to um, that have come up onto the stage tonight so at the moment we're just keeping it to the people that were um invited but um yeah hopefully we can get around to people eventually but uh, at the moment yeah there's specific people being asked up for for reasons based on what george uh, and i were looking to cover off tonight so uh, anyway sorry george I, I i interrupted you no problem i'll just make it quick so we can get more people up here and i was just saying i i would look at some of the things that other CBDCs did well, some of the things that they didn't do well, and I would use that to build or to plan the rollout for my CBDC. So I think one of the reasons the Nigerian central bank uh, failed was because they called it something different. They called it an E-whatever, and I'm not sure what the currency is in Nigeria, but I, there's no way I would have called it something different. So when Jerome Powell rolls out a CBDC and says, hey, download this app and you too can have an account at the Fed, there was no way I would call it FedCoin. I'd just simply say it's just dollars. It's just, it's, it's dollars just like the dollars in your B of A account. And another thing that I, another reason or another thing that I think will expedite the process is crisis. So it, it, without a crisis, this could take five, ten years, who knows how long. But if we have a financial crisis, then I think it's going to open up the door and incentivize the normie to go ahead and get those dollars that are liabilities of a bank that can go bust and get them over to the Federal Reserve as soon as possible so you're not taking any of that risk. And then I think there are cultural differences from the standpoint of, I mean, Ragnar hit it right on the head, or the nail on the head. When I'm here in Colombia and in South America, everyone thinks the government's a joke. I mean, they, they don't trust them as far as they can throw them. Where in the United States, in Canada, in other places, they have a, more of a paternal relationship with the government. And I think that could lead to maybe an easier rollout along with the other things that I would mentioned. Sure, BJ, you've had your hand up for ages, man, so, uh, and then we'll jump to Mechanic, if that's all right with you, George. Sure. Yeah, 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 cool. Um, you know, George, I think also the difference is your framing. So your framing, it comes from an entrepreneur who had to build a business, had to perform, had to profit, or else you would lose it. Uh, I don't know if you heard, politics is corrupt. It's the complete opposite, man. Uh, and it's it's by design that it's corrupt, and this is where you get you know, like for example I'll give you for, well, a perfect example in Canada. Why do people go to provincial, which is equivalent of state level of government, as opposed to the federal government when they run for office? Because that's where the money is. The money is when you know we saw a lot of this in Canada uh, when the provincial government went on a trade mission. To, um, they did one in, in Medellin, they did one in Rio de Janeiro. Why the hell would you have 
state or provincial leaders going to meet with state and provincial leaders in a third world country because it's money laundering and corruption and bribes and big deals to bring business over here do manufacturing swaps and everybody is taking money off the top but they don't get the money then they get the money four years down the line five years down the line when they've moved to the federal level through a series of shell companies and lobby firms are the ones who run it you can't have that sort of mass scale corruption with a, 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 a cbdc that tracks everything it's never going to happen it, it can't it, it, our governments can't function that way at this point you know so that's why and ragnar's experience perfectly overlays the type of experience that what i've witnessed in politics it's no different here it's a banana republic in every country around the world but in the other thing is with what chris's point was about you know western people in the west being more subservient but you know in politics believe it or not they call their base the sheeple here but it doesn't matter because there's somebody for in particular i'm thinking of in canada all he does is calls the prime minister of the country and says and remember these are older people who don't even like bitcoin and he just says i control one and a half percent of our gdp we're not getting a cbdc or i'm getting out of the country and i'm going to spend the rest of my life destroying your reputation that's how it works we're never going to have it these old guys that have tens of billions of dollars who don't like bitcoin are going to accept a, a cbdc never that's why i'm so bullish yeah so let me argue your, your point that original point that you made and i am looking at it through the lens of an entrepreneur and how would i tailor a product uh, to you know cater to the the most amount of people possible and to where they would actually buy it they would want to buy it right send so me just jamming it down their throat and, and to your point if they were going about this in a smart way they wouldn't be calling it a cbdc to begin with because the cbdc has such a negative connotation it has such negative pr that's one thing i was thinking about when i was reading this report from swift i'm like if these guys knew anything about marketing they they they'd be calling it something different <laughs> they wouldn't be calling it a cbdc so maybe you got a point there well you I I could tell you so many stories of how incompetent and stupid their mark. Look, a quick, very short story. When I ran, I ran against Trudeau. That's when I ran federally. And we got the lid to my campaign office. And what was it? It was a slogan, uh, Justin Trudeau, he's just not ready. So I called the headquarters in Parliament in Ottawa, and I said, the OLL, OLO, and I said, what's wrong with you morons? And they said, what do you mean? I said... For rule number one of marketing, the subconscious cannot process a negative thought. So when you say he's just not ready, you're forcing the recipient to imagine him as prime minister. You know what the response was from the 24-year-old kid running the entire campaign? Hmm. Oh, really? I didn't think about that. Right. <laughs> and that's it, man. Like, they're, they're awful. And also Jerome Powell, like not him particularly, whatever, but in the, the entrepreneurial mindset is... I'm here to perform. The political mindset is I'm here for my reputation. They don't care about like Jerome Powell just wants to get through without having his knees cut off so he can walk out and have a legacy where he didn't cause any damage and he can go to something in the private sector. Mm. That's it. Yeah, great points. Chris, do you want to go to, to your your buddy here that uh, you and yeah, have been waiting? I think it would be good to switch it off a little bit now and kind of move back to um, maybe some technicals, George. And, and I think it would be useful for you and maybe the audience as well to just understand um, a bit more about the mining. And um, Mechanic um, um, Co. Um, runs Ocean with Luke Dash and I'm sure other people. Um, and um, I think they really identified um, points of centralization happening. And I think to Jeff Booth's um, point around innovation happening when the the need demands it um you know i i very much view um ocean as, as as doing something positive in that direction so um mechanic welcome and and hopefully that set, lays it up nicely for you to kind of give us a bit of an overview as to what you guys are doing in the bitcoin space and why more importantly 
Hello. Yeah, sorry. I, I didn't hear much of this. So I feel like this is very much off topic at the moment, uh, given what the nature of the conversation is, which is pretty interesting, actually. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what what's the concern going on about Bitcoin here. What are we all worried uh, about it? So I think it's in the context of, of George um, has has recently seen that Swift have announced CBDCs uh, or a CBDC um, capability, um, and obviously is is run and controlled by um, the, the the banking system, and so therefore, uh, I think there's there's an urgency for a decentralised alternative, um, uh, and and Bitcoin is is that. I think George, you were keen to to kind of look at the mechanics behind Bitcoin as well as the 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 overriding kind of concerns around CBDCs themselves. And that's what you're trying to yeah, piece specifically together. specifically, Chris, privacy. Yeah, yeah, okay, right, got it. Privacy yeah. from a transactional standpoint. So I'm not looking at Bitcoin right now from a store of value or, or you know, able to transport it across borders. Uh, we all know that well. What I'm just trying to hyper-focus on is... How can we use the tools that are available today to create more privacy around our transactions so the government doesn't know what we're doing, just assuming we go into this CBDC world? Is that layer one? Is that layer two? You know, how do we navigate that? Right. So, good question. So, when it comes to Bitcoin... Um, it's not very private. However, one of the main reasons you want your activity to be private is so that anyone that's interested in uh, censoring you or blocking you from doing what you want isn't uh, is unable to have the information they need to do nefarious things with that. So in Bitcoin, it's been public as anything could possibly be, but it's also been decentralized to the point where if someone knows who you are and what you're doing, they don't have anything they can do with that because they can't stop you from spending your UTXO because the process of spending it um, is, you know, something that's very difficult for them to stop. However, at the moment, this basically comes down to what, who or what gets to decide what ends up in the blockchain and what doesn't. And that's now basically the most centralized part of Bitcoin. That's under 10 or maybe a dozen generously actors in the space that make that decision about what gets in the chain and what doesn't. So Bitcoin's lack of privacy, which is pretty awful, can actually be leveraged against people in the current environment. It's an accident waiting to happen um, and something is should be and is being done about it thankfully so without blowing my own trumpet or oceans trumpet too much that's basically why we're here because hashing which is one component of mining uh not the component of transaction selection um but nonetheless the proof of work part of bitcoin mining is very very decentralized which is great however they all defer to pools and pools are the ones that decide what does and does not get in the blockchain uh, that is super centralized and like I said, it's an accident waiting to happen. So someone needed to push things forward and say, okay, uh, we need to move uh, block construction back to the miner away from the pool and then we don't need to worry about this as much. Um, but I mean, it's all in service of that one thing. Um, you know, Bitcoin is saying we're public, but we don't care because we're decentralized. That's kind of a, a cypherpunk approach, uh, even if it kind of is you know, completely against some of the technology that cypherpunk principles give us, like, you know, um, public the celebration of public key cryptography, which allows us to communicate privately over public channels, which is awesome. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, but aside from that, it's not just um, the ability to transact and be uncensor, uncensorable, or unconfiscatable. There are other reasons we want Bitcoin to be private too. Um, reasons of basic security uh, and those need to be addressed independently and that is independent of what I'm talking about here with Ocean um, you know so there's all those privacy techniques like coin joining and good UTXO management uh, things like that the manner in which you acquire your bitcoins is very important and how you use them is equally important 
So yes, big topic. Happy to start digging into it. Um, if yeah, can you expand on that that last part a little bit more? Because what I'm and I'm not saying this is the only use case. There's obviously a lot of them here that we've discussed, but I'm trying to focus on the privacy component of it. And I and so it sounds like what you're saying is right now there's really not much privacy, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because even if the government does know what you're doing, they, they just can't stop it. But what I'm trying to do is say, okay, well, what if we do have a social score and it might impact your ability to get a loan and therefore you, you want that element of privacy even though you know the government can't interfere with the transaction itself. So have you, have you, have you, are you guys working on solutions in that area? No, not really. Uh, let me make. Sh let me just be clear, though. I don't. Uh, I'm saying one of the the reasons privacy is taken kind of a backseat in Bitcoin is because one of the ways being public can be used against you hasn't been particularly possible in Bitcoin. That's all I'm saying. I don't want to say that it's not super important and that it's yeah. an area that needs a lot of focus. No, so when it, comes, yeah. when it comes to privacy techniques in Bitcoin. It's it's a complicated thing to do because you're you're going against the grain. Um, it's it's just an ironic thing about having a public ledger and you know this horrible trade off between you know a trustless network where anyone can do anything uh, and therefore everyone needs to know everything. Like juxtaposing that with privacy is really difficult because you know, you want privacy um, centralized things. You need that efficiency of centralization to give you privacy, and so, which is pretty awkward. So I don't know. I don't know where we're going with that. Coin joins are great. I wish we had cross input signature to incentivize them. Um, there's a few other things in that regard. But um, hold on, just a sec. Yeah, and I think George, that you know, the way that people get around it at the moment, which we've already talked about, is that they will peg out of their Bitcoin into another. Um, another either mechanism, so layer two, or even another coin. So there's there's things like Monero, for example. That, no, this is um, like the worst. This is such a bad approach to it that you want to stay with but, but, that, yeah. but that's what people do do. You know, there, there is an element of people looking for solutions. They might they, they might not be picking the right one, but the, but that's certainly a motivation for why they would potentially go outside of Bitcoin and away from the public ledger. Um, and I think it's worth acknowledging that those things are happening. Um, but well, you can like, use Lightning too. Remember, Lightning exists, and Lightning's pretty private by design. Absolutely. Funnily enough, that's an ironic thing about ocean development is that we have this, we have um, a, a sort of higher bar for what we do when it comes to payouts for miners than any other pool. Uh, to that end, we have to prove everything. Uh, now, that's really easy with on-chain because there's no privacy, right? We just say, hey, this Bitcoin address got that much money and everyone will agree that it did. But when it comes to Lightning payouts, we're saying, yeah, we paid this guy. Um, Lightning is private by design. So actually, loads of people could just turn around and say, no, you didn't. And then we just get accused of you know, not paying people what we said we'd pay them. So we have to use Bolt 12, which allows us to prove that we've paid people. But this is kind of bleeding edge in Lightning and works against the grain of how Lightning works. So all that is to say, Lightning's super private by design. And if you want to use it, to, like open a Lightning channel and do what you like with it. And you're probably fine. Like It's one of my favorite things about it. No one else in the network really needs to care about the state of your channel, which is why it can be private unlike your UTXOs, where everyone needs to agree that you, the UTXO is what it says it is, which is why there's no privacy there. Does that help, George? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that's very, very eye-opening for sure, and it fills in some of the gaps. You know, it just, it sounds ridiculous, but it seems like <laughs> the best option right now for privacy is just cash. It, it's like... Of course it is. That's a very, it's, it's incredibly yeah. useful in that regard because it's incredibly primitive technologies. Like the minute you move to more advanced technology, privacy just gets ruined. That's just how it works. Yeah. It's like cash, cash, like this is, CBDC is just fiat with a bug fix. 
to get rid of cash because cash was too primitive to be used effectively as a weapon against the people that might use it. That's all. Like, if you could have more sophisticated cash, they would do it in five minutes. And they hate cash for that reason. And, and they're constantly pushing for a cash-free society. And I remember in COVID, they were saying, oh, it transmits COVID. Like, don't use cash because you'll get COVID from it. And there's all these agendas against it. They can't get rid of it completely because they kind of need it. Um, it's just, but I mean, it's, the CBDC is just fiat without that tiny little escape hatch of cash where people can finally just remain operating, you know, but it's, it's still slave money because it's still fiat. It's just so unsophisticated that it can't be weaponized as effectively. So in the UK and Europe, they will take it out of circulation and every, every couple of years, all the banknotes will go out of uh, you know, they will be stripped of their legal tender status and you have to go and put it in a bank uh, and you have a certain amount of months to do it before it goes out of circulation. So it's not like American dollars where people would bury $100 bills, you know, in Venezuela for, you know, two decades and they'd still be useful when they go and dig them up. Like That hasn't been possible in any other sort of functional fiat economy for decades because they would just keep iterating and making new versions of it so basically and like to be honest how useful is it like if you want to i when i have loads of cash like invisible cash i can't really think of much more to do with it than go out and eat nice meals in restaurants like if you want to buy a car or a house with cash that's like that doesn't officially exist that you haven't declared i don't think you're gonna get away with it like i don't i don't really think there's They've basically pulled up the ladder with it, and there's not a lot you can do with it. And a lot of places will charge you more for using cash now. And I don't know. It's it's just its utilities kind of run out, I think. And, you know, if we move to CBDC, it's over. But it's, it's happening. And I think that little escape hatch of cash, though, has been useful for a long time. I just think, but and the stark contrast of it, without that escape hatch, fiat without cash, is so much worse than fiat with cash, even despite what I just said. So it's going to be fun to watch that like reality coming at everyone quick when there really is a cashless economy. Yeah, so I think this is really important when people think about a plan B. And this is something I talk about on my channel quite frequently. Is Right now in Colombia, as an example, like 70% of the transactions are settled in cash. In fact, I, I told the story... I don't know if it was on the spaces yesterday or the other day, Chris, or not. But I bought a new camera that's unfortunately not working. But it's one of these fancy, like, 4K Sony cameras or whatever. And it was like $4,000. And I bought it from the camera store at the mall, at a huge mall. So it wasn't like a shady place or something. And I saw the camera. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. This is actually what I need. So I'm like, you know, how much is it? Like four grand. I'm like, you know, in pesos. I'm like, okay, cool. And I give him the card. And he's like, oh yeah, it's cash only. I'm like, cash for a four thousand dollar camera? I go, who's gonna be walking around in a mall in Colombia with the equivalent of four thousand dollars in cash? But that's just how things are are done here. You know, another funny story is I was renting a place up on the hill. It was about, uh, you know, it was, it was roughly, you know, 10, 12 grand a month. And uh, I was going to pay him like three or four months in advance. So it was roughly like 40 grand. And th the guy said, oh, yeah, I, I just want cash. And I'm like, you, you can't be serious. And he's like, yeah, I just, I'm like, how, how do you expect me to do this? He's like, well, just have your assistant. I'll go down to the bank and they can just give me the money. And we just put it in a bag. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, if that's what you want. And I asked Adriana, my assistant, I said, I is this going to work? Like, is the bank going to go for that? And she's like, oh, yeah, they do it all the time. Because people here are so accustomed to dealing with cash that the banks just do those types of transactions constantly. So I'm not saying that it's a solution forever, but at least it gives you maybe a little bit more runway. Cool. Chris, did you want to go to another speaker? Um, I'm 
Uh, yeah, there's there's lots of there's lots of requests. I'm going to have to call it a day I'll, soon. I'll, so, yeah. I'll drop down, Chris, if you want. No, no, go for it, BJ. It's fine. No, 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 I'm going to drop down so somebody else can come in. Uh, George, it was a pleasure, man. And hopefully we can do this again soon. Yeah, right? absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, George, I don't know whether we've come to a bit of a natural uh, conclusion there. I'm yeah, going to, as I said, sounds... I'm going to have to go in about a few minutes anyway. So um, okay. hopefully that's been, but that hopefully that's been useful. Oh, absolutely! This was fantastic, and I really appreciate everyone's input. And um, yeah, I'm sure this will evolve constantly. So uh, maybe we just do this once every couple months or so, just to keep everyone updated. Absolutely, I think there's lots of uh, lots of activity that's going to be on the well, not even on the horizon. It's right in front of our faces. So uh, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how it develops. So it'd be good yeah. to get some great people up like we have today. All right, Chris, thanks for co-hosting, buddy. Good luck with the motorcycle. <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> Take it easy. I'll see everyone soon. All right, bye, guys. Cheers, bye.